This is Mark Tooley, uh, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy, and president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy in Washington, D.C. And I have the pleasure of speaking with Rebecca Heinrichs, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and most importantly, a contributing editor to uh, our magazine, Providence. And uh, we're going to discuss uh, geopolitics uh, with a, maybe a dash of uh, spirituality and uh, theology. Uh, Rebecca, it's great to have you with us. Thank you so much for inviting me, Mark. And how are you surviving the pandemic? We are doing well. I'm enjoying the extra time with my five children, and I am enjoying the, the new role as primary educator uh, for their academics while, while working with the, the curriculum and the school administrators. So that's been a fun and unexpected thing. And now that we've got a good system, I think, in place. Uh, we're, we're finally getting the, the swing of it, and I think there's just about four weeks left of school, and then it's a real summer. Well, uh, I should point out that, that Rebecca, besides being an extraordinary mother, uh, is uh, an expert on geopolitics, specifically um, missile defense and uh, nuclear weapons. So maybe we'll uh, touch on that. But uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Christian realism. I believe that you would identify with that uh, category, which of course uh, is a chief focus for Providence. What is your understanding of Christian realism and how do you apply that to your work? Thanks, it's a great question. Um, first, I have to say a little bit of my background too. I, I studied political philosophy in college. So a lot of my formative thinking about how to view America's role in the world comes from a lot, comes straight from the the great books and the, the great thinkers that influenced, obviously, the Enlightenment thinkers and, and formed the United States. So my, my most formative background is, uh, comes from, again, the, the, the Greek thinkers and then also Locke. Uh, and so I was given an education in college that uh, put those forward as uh, good, good contributors to, to American thinking. And, um, and then as I've grown in my own faith, uh, I have wrestled with and grappled uh, with what, what does Christianity say about this? And what was, in a very serious way, Christianity's role in forming the thinking of the American revolutionaries? And, and what does that mean for the United States and our role in the world? So that's kind of a roundabout way uh, of how I began to really grapple with this in a, in a serious way. So, so what do I think about it now? Uh, first, I would just say, one, we, we don't have the luxury of not grappling with it uh, as, as Christians. You know, we don't compartmentalize our, our Christian faith and then, and then think about uh, foreign policy or politics in a separate category. We have to grapple with them seriously. And, and so um, what, what this means is uh, I understand that human depravity is real and true. This is a, a reality that, um, that, that we have to uh, accept. And, and form our policies based on this reality. Uh, it means also that we are not, hu human perfectibility is, is neither possible nor something that we should uh, try to do in American foreign policy because it isn't um, something that is possible. A and also that, that God has given governments, he's instituted governments and they do have the authority uh, uh, of carrying out justice, and they have the sword, they, they, and, and they wield the sword uh, to carry out justice. And, and, and these are realities. This is not something, you know, that this, this strand of, of Christian thinking that has kind of seeped into American foreign policy that is pacif pacifist um, is actually not something that I think is, is in line with, with the American Christian uh, tradition. Um, and not not the way is not not the way that it that it should, and, um, and and so that's a part of what I what I grapple with in when I think about American foreign policy. And it's good. There is nothing. There is no moral neutrality. There is nothing that is morally neutral. So when the United States engages in the world and thinks through what we should do with this country or that country, it's not it's not an amoral decision. And so we should grapple with. Uh, with what is right and what is just as we engage in the world. And, and then because of the, um, the political context we're in now with this rise of nationalism versus globalism, I think it's worth 
uh, discussing just for a brief moment what all of that means for the United States. Um, and I would just say that, uh, that um, Christian realism, I think, is consistent with the, or rather this idea is consistent with Christian realism, which is that we have different obligations to different people um, because of the roles they play in our lives and, and the proximity they have to us. So the family is a good thing in which I primarily care for my children. I care about my neighbor's children, but I care more about my own children. And that's a good thing. And it's the way the Lord has, has made families. Um, and then you care about your community, you care about your state, you care about your country, and you have certain moral obligations, duties to those. Um, but that, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't mean that we are exempted from or don't have the ability to close off from the rest of the world or discount or, or not care about the rest of the world. I still have some kind of moral obligation to, to love for my neighbor in Afghanistan. Now, we should grapple with that, about what that means. Sometimes it means not doing anything because doing something would cause a positive harm to this person. Sometimes it means engaging on their behalf. But, but, but that is a serious thing that I think um, uh, the United States should grapple with. We are concerned about what is just and, um, and, and so, you know, I, I reject this notion that realism means that we don't care about the morality that underpins what we do. And, and some of these other ideas about international relations, um, I, I think, are, are leading us astray as we grapple with what is actually America's role in the world and how, how should we think about it in terms of um, uh, what is just, uh, which, which obviously I, I, what informs me in that regard is, is is my Christian faith. Um, I'll leave it at that and let you get to another question and then maybe we can flesh some of that out a little bit more. You are a Christian realist. Are you also a nationalist and can the two go together? So um, I, I anticipated you asking me that question. I have, I have, I am sympathetic to how those who are defending nationalism are, are going about it. Uh, the, the problem I have with it is I, I, could, I wouldn't say that I am a defensive of nationalism qua nationalism. I, am, I, I believe that there is a, uh, a real good legitimate argument to be made that, that we should defend the concept of the nation and that nations are comprised of different regimes and the different regimes are grappling with these questions of justice as well. And so I, I think that we should return to, I think we've gotten away from this idea of defending the nation and that the United States is a separate kind of regime from other nations, even the ones we really like, even our European allies and partners, um, that, that we are different and we're going to have conflicting interests at some point. And, and so I think to, to try to erase some of those lines uh, for the sake of globalism or this idea that we are moving towards Fukuyama's end of history where there are it's a borderless world in which we're really all just a series of equal democracies with peaceful trade and no real reason to fight or disagree is is not only not conducive to peace but it it is wrong and I and I think that uh, so I'm so I'm, I'm I've been uh, fascinated with the tracking this argument. I've spoken at the, the um, conservative nationalism conference and, and I essentially said some of those things where I said that, you know, I believe that the United States should uh, return to this idea that putting America's priorities first is a good thing and that we should embrace it and, and not, uh, you know, not, um, rather than rather as we should not eschew this idea that anything that we do in the world based on our own interests is wrong and that the only good is altruistic you know if uh, if we're if we're giving to another country and pouring a bunch of money into it that's good but if the united states wants the, uh, these other countries to contribute more to our own collective security that that's bad um i i reject that and and so i think that the united states embracing the, the concept of 
national sovereignty in allowing these countries a little bit more elbow room to make decisions on their own to contribute positively and to recognize and respect that other countries uh, think about these questions of, of justice differently. Now, I think we're right. So I, dis I also disagree with the notion that the United States is just one among many nations of equal moral weight. Um, I think that the United States essentially got it right at the time of the American founding. Not that we carried out every single policy correctly. Um, clearly, we had slavery at the time of the American founding, but we fought a bloody civil war uh, in order to, to, to have a new birth of freedom consistent with uh, our, our founding ideals. And so um, I, I do believe that the United States uh, has the, the moral high ground as we engage in the world because of our founding principles. But I think that we need to make sure as a country that we go back to those and understand what it is that makes the United States regime different than other countries. And um, I, because if we don't do that, uh, you know, I think that we run the risk of essentially uh, losing what gives us the moral authority to carry that mantle of global leadership. Um, and, and again, if, if we don't um, defend ourselves and make sure that we have a robust uh, American defense and security uh, for the so for the flourish so that our own people can flourish, we, we will have a much harder time engaging in the world for the betterment of any other country or people. So you are a Christian realist. You're a form of nationalist. Uh, you mentioned John Locke. Are you a form? Of, are you a classical liberal, not a, a contemporary progressive, but a classical liberal in the Lockean sense? Well, that is so. I. I, this is what I, I believe that the uh, Locke was right about um, the, the dignity and the value and the worth of the individual person. And that government, what makes the United States and our democratic republic different um, from, from many other countries is that we do believe in, in the dignity and worth and the value of the individual self-governing person. Um, and, and without that, you lose a lot of what is American. Um, and, and you can see if you go down that path of what it looks like when you, when you uh, fail to appreciate these Lockean principles, you can see what other kinds of regimes um, look like. For instance, because China's on everybody's mind and mine as well, um, Xi Jinping's Communist Party, um, simply rejects that idea uh, of the individual dignity and worth of the self-governing autonomous person. They have a inherently collective view of, of, what, is, of what is good. Um, now you can say, okay, well, maybe that doesn't sound so bad, but then you look at what that looks like in real practice and you have camps where you have Uyghur Muslims, you have Christians where there is no such thing as religious liberty, uh, Christians can only meet for, you know, with so many uh, people in the room and you can't have crosses outside because they believe that that would be undermining the, the unity of the Communist Party. Y you can see what that looks like and it is anathema to what, to the American, um, to, to the meaning of what Americans believe is right and good and just and good for human flourishing. So you can't get rid of luck. <laughs> so you can't, if you, you, if you get rid of luck, you get rid of, of, of the seasoning and, and the, the underpin, some of the intellectual underpinnings that, that make the United States what it is and that, that is good for Christians and of course other religions as well. But um, we, we, we want to love and worship God openly and love and love our neighbor openly. And you can do that uh, in best and most openly in a society that values um, uh, religious freedom. So, um, however, I do believe that those who are critical of Locke right now um, are, are seeing a problem where we've, we've gotten to a point, and this is progressivism, I think, uh, fault. I actually do believe it's a misunderstanding of Locke, where, we, where perhaps we've gotten to the point where some of the libertarian conservatives, I, I really have never really truly thought of libertarians as conservatives, but, but you have those who are sort of in this intellectual school who, would, who uh, agree with a lot of what conservatives think. Um, and they become, I think, wrongly 
focused on the prioritization of autonomy over the pursuit of the good. And, and what I mean by that is there is a confusion between liberty and licentiousness. So licentiousness should be tolerated in the view of somebody who is a libertarian, uh, and I think somebody who misunderstands Locke, that licentiousness um, is a quote unquote blessing of liberty because it means that the rest of us can pursue happiness in some other way um, and licentiousness for one man is liberty for another. Um, I would argue that, uh, that no, that the, that the individualism and the value of the individual person was always meant to pursue virtue or to pursue the good. And, and it is an abuse of that liberty when you pursue uh, licentiousness or selfishness at the expense of another, or uh, when, you, when you go down that path where you, you basically see rampant sexu sec uh, secularism today, um, and, and uh, that's a problem. And, and if you look back uh, at, you know, I was curious to know, how, how did the early Americans understand law? You know, we can talk in the abstract about what Locke means and we can read Locke and grapple with it and, and, and try to think through current cultural problems in the context of Locke. But if you go back and you, you read the political sermons of the American founding and you can see a lot of these uh, devout Christians embraced Locke. And they always understood that Locke, Locke was necessary but not sufficient for the good life and for the start of this new country that Locke enabled the pursuit of the good and the pursuit of, of, of happiness and, and of the righteous and holy life to the extent that we're able this side of eternity. And, and so I, 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 am, I, I am very sympathetic to those who, who, who criticize the libertarian view today, especially with the, um, uh, the, the, the debate going on between do we do we replace then with the current uh, system with this Catholic integralism uh, that has a much uh, stronger input in in how the government should should dictate and pressure human you know the, the American people towards the good and and I certainly reject that you know as a, as a Baptist myself it gets me a little bit uncomfortable when I start to hear those I, I agree with on some of these intellectual challenges start advocating for something that looks a lot like Catholic integralism. Um, instead, what I would hope for though, is for a, a, a where I tend to try to play a little bit of a, a role in, in the discussion is um, a much more defense of, of the good and a public rejection of what we see happening with secularism in the, in the public square. And, um, and that, uh, again, Locke is necessary but not sufficient. And there is a great role for Christian intellectuals to play in the public debate. And, and, that, um, and that we should roll up our sleeves and get in there and make these, these strong arguments to, to affect decision makers, to affect policy makers, so that, uh, so that we can steer the conversation and then America's engagement in the world and policies uh, to an end that I think is, is good for the United States and, and good for the rest of the world. That is a very long answer to that question, but it is one that I think is so important. And as you and I were chatting before, you know, I, I focus on national security and foreign policy, but I, I can't get away from some of these intellectual discussions about what it means to be American and what the American regime ought to be like, because our biggest threat facing the United States right now comes from China. And, and China, uh, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party, is, is very interested in not just living in a world peacefully with the United States in which we are still the global superpower and they are the second you know, largest economy, um, but, but they want to surpass us. And then with that surpassing us economically, they want the moral influence that they believe they are owed because of the strength of their economy and, and increasingly the military that they have been very steadily developing on the backs of Western uh, 
intellectual property, um, but but they they will wrest this mantle from us if we aren't determined to keep it. And and so I think uh, it, it's, it's critical at this point in our country's history that we have a reawakening of, of what makes America great and that we appreciate that and, and defend it because uh, the Chinese will, will take that mantle from us not not necessarily by force, but but by acquiescence, if we don't contest it. Now, uh, very much in sync uh, with Providence, you as a Christian believe that uh, the United States should remain the paramount power in the world uh, with a uh, strong national defense and assertive uh, foreign policy. Uh, increasingly, many Christians today uh, take issue with that perspective and believe it's at odds with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and of course, you uh, very much support American uh, nuclear deterrence, which other Christians would take issue with. So uh, how do you integrate your Christian faith with a strong belief in uh, lethal force in terms of uh, military power? Yes, so um, I've never, I don't think there's a, there's a bone in my body that's a pacifist. Um, that, that part of uh, understanding the world as we know, you know, as, as Christ, Christians, Christians should be the most realistic of any kind of people because not only do we have uh, just the common grace of looking around the world and seeing how human beings behave and act but we also have the benefit of divine revelation in the holy scriptures all of which tells us that human beings are complex creatures uh very bad but also the potential of doing great things because we're created in the image of god um but we, we, we inside each of us is a little tyrant and we need to be restrained. And so God instituted governments to, to create uh, uh, a, a system in which we can be protected from one another. And the United States, of course, then um, has created a government in which we even put all of these checks on ourselves because we know that even the governments we elect will turn tyrannical, which you can see with um, even just during this coronavirus, how you give these local governments even just the tiniest bit of power, how they just continue to take more. It's just this appetite uh, that, that, that all human beings um, seem to have, or not even seem to have, that we know have. And, and so, Okay, so then, so then what? So part of what the government has in order to uh, maintain the peace and to carry out justice is, is the sword. Uh, nuclear weapons are the ultimate sword. And so when, when I explain nuclear theory and, and the value of nuclear weapons to, to my class, I, I teach at a graduate uh, school. One of the things I, I explain is, um, the morality of the weapon, it, it's, it's, you can't grapple with the inherent morality of the weapon. You'll have some that say nuclear weapons are bad in and of themselves, and so we should rid the world of nuclear weapons. To which my response is, well, it depends on the country. It depends on the country who has them and how they use them. So for the United States, our nuclear weapons um, have been used. They, they are, and even our... Um, strategic command, the command that um, has control over those uh, nuclear weapons for the United States, that um, they are a force for good in the world. And uh, they are there to, to deter mass conflict, to preserve the peace. And, um, and when I say mass conflict, I mean just the worst kinds of war. That's what they're there for. And, um, and, and obviously, we were the only country that's ever employed them uh, at the end of World War II that concluded that, that war. And, uh, and so we, we have a special responsibility as custodians of those. And, and I believe, you know, there's some people will say, well, wouldn't you like it, Rebecca, if, if we could snap our fingers and get rid of nuclear weapons, though? Everybody all at the same time. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Um, I, I've argued, actually, no. I would not even be excited for that because uh, because the technology has already been developed. You can't you can't put that genie back in the bottle, even if you could get rid of all of the nuclear weapons. And so, essentially, we would be waiting for one of these other countries to break out with a capability at some point. And I don't want to yield uh, the uh, American ability to compel other nations with malign intent to to stop their malign behavior or to deter them from, 
from moving even more aggressively than they are. Uh, and so I spend a lot of my time trying to make sure that uh, that, that the right arguments are made, that our, our nuclear weapons are the backbone of our, of our national defense, and, and that we need to make sure that not only are they maintained, but that we're adapting the force as the threats necessitate that we must. So the two countries right now that we're, that we're most worried about when it comes to uh, de de deterring the worst kinds of war, of course, are China is the main one and Russia. Bo both of those countries have a significant ability and malign intent to undermine the United States, and they have uh, the militaries that are that can carry that out. So that's what you look at. You look at intent and ability. And there's other really bad countries. North Korea is terrible. Iran is terrible. And so we have to contend with those as well. But when we really think about um, our nuclear force and 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 how to make sure that we are not only maintaining it but adapting it. Um, in, in a way that, that communicates to those countries that whatever political end they think they might achieve for acting aggressively against the United States or our primary interests, that the end result that, and how we would respond would not be worth whatever they think they might gain politically. And that is the heart of deterrence. And, um, and there's many other conventional non-nuclear weapons that play into that calculation as we try to convince our, our adversaries, but, but nuclear weapons are the backstop for everything else that we use in order to deter war and preserve the peace. Final question for you, uh, Rebecca. Post-coronavirus, as our strategic competition with China almost certainly will uh, accelerate, um, how hopeful are you that the United States and our concept of democracy uh, ultimately will prevail in that competition? So I, I am, um, I don't know if this is my, uh, maybe my combination of my uh, Christian thinking or eternal optimism as from being an American, but I am hopeful. I am hopeful because this, this pandemic has been um, obviously terrible globally. I mean, it has crushed economies. Uh, it has sickened thousands and thousands of people. We've lost the lives of, of many people. Um, if, if you could say that there's been any good that, have, have, that has come from it um, globally, I think one thing is it has really revealed how bad the world would be if China was the preeminent influencer and the one whom all of these countries rely on. And you can see that in terms of um, the supply chains that we continue to hear about, how much of our own medical supplies are, we have again, by acquiescence and because of the primary concern, I think foolishly, of looking at how do we have just the cheapest goods and how do we get things um, manufactured most cheaply. I think that was a mistake. And I think that the, um, the bipartisan, and this has been a Republican and Democratic failing, the belief that, and it goes back to this globalism challenge, there was a belief for the last, I think, 30 years or so that, um, that I think has influenced a lot of public thought that one, the great wars are behind us. And so, you know, you, you get, you get where the cold war is behind us and now we're, we're moving into this time of um, great peace and, and um, the United States is the preeminent power. And so we started to look away from the possibility that there might be other great power conflicts. There was that a line of thinking combined with this thinking that, and if you rope everybody into the same international global economic system, that that will be enough to check and uh, change and reform some of the things that we don't like. Um, I think that that was a misreading of the nature of human beings. Being rich is not necessarily what the Chinese Communist Party cares about more than anything. It is, it is Chinese socialism. It is, it is. Stalinism. Uh, they believe in, uh, in, in the rightness of, of Chinese socialism. And, and, and so as they have been uh, benefiting from this globalized economy and the offshoring, the manufacturing of some of our critical supplies into their own country, and as other countries, other Western democratic countries become uh, reliant on China, they use that as leverage. They don't embrace 
the same principles of transparency and reciprocity and fairness and justice that we do. They simply don't. They've grappled with the question and they have come up with a completely different paradigm with different contours of what is right and good. And they believe that they are right. And, and so they, they're, they're not satisfied with merely coexisting. They, would, they, they are being very intentional about uh, carrying out this plan in which, in which the Chinese um, are sitting at top, on the top of this globalized world order. And Xi Jinping made that clear in Davos in 2017. He, he has laid this out in speeches. Um, and, and you can see he's not content with merely censorship inside China, but he, they, 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 they try to censor American universities. They, they donate tons of money to American universities, but then they have strings attached about what the university can teach and say. Um, all, all, of these, all of these problems across the board, I think that the United States and our allies are, um, are now seeing and can't afford to look away. And you, you've seen now Australia is being punished by the Chinese government now because the Australian government is trying to seek to the, the, they want clarity, more clarity about the origins of the coronavirus inside Wuhan. And the Chinese government, of course, doesn't want any further investigation of, of that. And so now China is, is cutting off some trade um, with Australia as punishment. So you can see they're using the, these kinds of things now, the reliance that Western countries have on them as, as tools um, against us, as weapons against us. So I think that the, the first step is clarity. And we have to recognize the nature of the problem. And then we can grapple with and have this rambunctious American debate that we we are so inclined to do about the policies that we need to implement first and how we do this. And until we have that, we, we, we can't move forward. And so I think, that, I think that that is happening now because of the coronavirus. And so it's my hope then that one, we've caught this soon enough along the long road in which China has been um, trying to seed and take away American global uh, leadership and preeminence, that we've caught it soon enough and that we can uh, we, we can work with our allies, we can stop hectoring our allies and can support and uh, work with and care for our allies in a way because the United States isn't going to be able to do this alone. We can't compete with China now all by ourselves. We're going to need the support and, um, and an architecture of, of allies who say, no, the, an American-led world is far preferable than a Chinese-led world. And, um, and so, leaning on those allies and, and, and allowing them to help us do that, I think, in the years to come uh, is necessary. And, and I'm encouraged. Uh, Japan, Taiwan, uh, India, you're starting to see some of these other countries that are, are, are demonstrating great promise for the United States in deterring and uh, deterring Russia or deterring China. And then, of course, and, and Russia as well. I don't want to forget the Russians because China has been getting so much attention, but they're just as bad. Putin's Russia is just as bad as they've ever been. Um, they just don't have the economy to do as much harm um, or the patience that the Chinese have uh, to, to surreptitiously do as much harm as what the Chinese have been doing. So um, with that said, I, I, I do think that you, you will see a rising. You can already see it in the, in the American presidential discussion. President Trump is now trying to figure out how to make the most of this newfound um, American political awareness that China is to blame for the coronavirus. And even though President Trump, I think his, his rhetoric about China and Xi Jinping has been terrible um, because the, the, even if well intended in order to try to maintain some kind of personal rapport with Xi Jinping, I think now is the time for clarity. And, and though the rhetoric doesn't and shouldn't um, exas exacerbate the problem that, that we need clarity so that we understand the nature of the regime and how the Chinese government has been behaving. And so I, I'm hopeful that President Trump will begin changing that rhetoric. But you can see Vice President Biden is also trying very much to, to make the case that he would in fact be tougher on China. Um, and, and so it's my hope though that, uh, that, that this becomes a bipartisan effort as we grapple with how to do that best and in the right order. Rebecca Heinrich, Senior Fellow with the Hudson Institute. Thank you for an excellent conversation. Thank you so much, Mark. Take care. So, uh,